All right, welcome everyone. Uh, I think it's time. Uh, you are in the right place. If you have a group policy, uh, please exit the stage. Uh, we don't want to talk to you. Group policy, yeah. Um, I'm Chris Walsh. Uh, many of you might know me. Uh, Windows Phone Poker. Uh, do a fair bit of development. Been doing it for about 15 years. Um, phone's been around for CE5, CE4 days. No. I've been dabbling with that. So my name's Jake Ginnivan. I'm a de senior developer for Redify. I've been playing around with phone for a little while. Started last year at DDD. Uh, well, no, it wasn't DDD. It was uh, Code Camp in Wagga Wagga, playing with Martweights. And that's where I got into Windows Phone. I've been playing with it ever since. So about 11 months ago, Microsoft said, hey, we've got a new phone. We want new developers to start developing for it. This new phone was pretty cool, but it, was, it did have some glaring omissions for features for you guys. And what we have today is going to show you all the features that we've added in and more, and how you can leverage those features to sell your app to make you, the developer, get some more money. So when we released, we're up against this guy. He's been there for a while. Um, he's had about four fifth, on, the, on the fifth iteration now, and uh, they're pretty solid. We've got, got a few phones out there. But the problem with this guy, the model for you guys as a developer is just, it's just an application. You're just another application on the phone. We don't really care what you do there. So you, there's your app. You don't have any hook points into the system to say, oh, my app surfaced in more places in this phone. This guy, almost the same thing. Problem with this guy is they don't really care what the application does or what it does or what your application does with the phone and the data on there. So fast forward to now. We're giving you the ability to integrate into hubs, musics, video, search extras, and a whole lot of other features on the phone that we're going to show you today. So one major thing that was missing was multitasking. You pressed home, navigated away from your app, and your app was tombstone and killed. So there goes the run keeper scenarios, background audio, video. And then uh, <coughs> when we realized that, you got, oh, okay, we uh, need a scenario to download data. So if someone does navigate away, we've uh, introduced the background transfer service. And then Jake's going to take you through some really cool enhancements for push notifications and live tiles and touch on sex extras. So multitasking the experience. When your application is at the start, the user loads it, they then press home. Your application is then pushed into the background. Previously, we'd kill your application within five seconds. So you had five seconds to save your data Save to isolated storage, then you kicked out the back door. At the moment, in Mango, we push you in the background. We push you into a what's called as a new dormant state. We sleep all threads, stop all sockets, and you push in the background. You're still in memory, and uh, you're not doing any processing. You're just in RAM. So to alleviate the issue of we've just disconnected your sockets, we've stopped all your music, we've stopped everything else you're doing in the UI portion, we have this concept of a background agent. What the background agent is going to do for you is the ability to do background processing. So you want to get the location of the phone, you have the location of the phone while your app's not running, or your UI portion is not running, or you've got a data feaster, or you're doing a background audio playing. All those kind of scenarios, and I'll go through the background agents in a minute. <coughs> okay. So there's a few other cool things that comes with uh, Mango that just gives you that extra integration into the platform. So as Chris was saying before, the whole iPhone, there's an app for that, there's an app for that. You don't get that real integrated experience and that's what Mango is really doing for phone. So one of the really nice ones that we have is notifications. You can, if you actually, you can register an alarm or a reminder for anything in Mango. So 
think of a public transport app, for instance. You could, you want five minutes before the bus arrives, you want a reminder, you can do that now in Mango. That's one of the really cool ones. So did, I'll go through um, the life cycle of multitasking. So we start off, our app starts off in running mode, right? As Chris was saying, we hit the home button, we, our app gets deactivated. This gives us a chance to save our state, but we don't dispose any of it because we can always come back to life and continue running. Once you've saved your state, your app moves into a dormant state where, as Chris said, all the th threads are slept and you, can, you might come back or you might not. Your app's just sitting in the background, not doing anything, still in memory. What can happen then is with it. Uh, user goes back into your app, gets reactivated, off you go again, you're running. The other option is that once with the multitasking, once you are about the sixth application along, your app will get tombstoned. In before Mango, this was <coughs> the default behavior, your app would just get tombstoned, and that's why you have to save your state, because your app will be removed from memory and then when your app is reactivated, after being tombstoned, it's your responsibility to restore state so the user thinks that the app was never closed. So just to reiterate, once you're reactivated, you only reload the state if you've been tombstoned. And as Jake said, the limit is five applications, but five applications also means if the person's got four browser tabs open, and your app's the, might be the third application actually in the background, you're still gonna get uh, tombstoned. So it's a little thing to, to take, take note. So with that, we'll uh, show you a quick demo of the multitasking experience. And here I have <coughs> my People Hub, for example. You can see that in the back, all right? User presses home, they're navigated away from the application. So you're then pushed into the dormant state within the five second limit. User then presses and holds the back key. They have the ability to see what else is in the back stack. So here is your application sitting in the back stack, uh, dormant, all your threads are slept, sockets are disconnected, you don't have access to do anything. But as soon as the user clicks on your application, you're reactivated, you come back into the running state, we reinitiate, you can reconnect your sockets and we reinitiate all threads. Pretty cool experience. <coughs> so background agents, you've got two types of agents. You've got a periodic agent and an on-idle agent. So the periodic agent, you get 25 seconds to do whatever you want to do with the phone before we stop, stop it again. So every 25 seconds, sorry, you're going to get 25 seconds in 10 minutes. So, but the thing with that is if you're after a GPS or the location of the phone, we won't start your second, we won't start your time until the GPS is warmed up or there's a value there sitting in memory just to give you straight away. So your 25 second starts when you want to do some work. It was 10 seconds a mix, but we've increased it for, at, uh, to 25 seconds in RTM. <coughs> so what the agent processing is, You've got your UI portion of your application, and you've got your background portion. Two different processes, so we can control the memory of what goes on. So this guy, you're limited to 90 meg, and this guy, depending on the scenario you're using for your background agent, you're three to six meg. So it's something to be wary of. User control through the control panel. So if you've got a background task, uh, users and issue users said, yep, I'm allowing you to install my background task. The user can then manually go into the settings of the phone. And disable your background task. Can you see that?
So this is a list of where your background agent might be. So if the user disables that and you try and access that through your UI portion of your application, you've got to make sure you test for that. Because the user can then go and disable it. The user disables it, your app's not running. Your background task isn't running. So you have 14 days to do whatever you want to do. If the UI portion of your application hasn't run within 14 days, your agents are stopped by default. So the only way to restart those agents is to get the user to navigate back into your application and then re renew the 14 days. So send them a push notification to say, hey, there's something new on the application. Reopen it. Re-renew your 14 days. <clears throat> and you do have the ability to synchronize within your background agent and UI portion through a mutex. So the type of scenarios, <coughs> sorry, every 30 minutes that was changed recently. So on idle agents, you only get external power, and it's a Wi-Fi or Ethernet network. So when the phone is plugged into the PC, or you're on a Wi-Fi network, and they're plugged into the wall, you can run your on idle agent. So the issue with that is someone might never have the ability to run the on idle agent, because they're always on, the, always on the run, might not have a home Wi-Fi network, so these are the scenarios you need to test for and check before using it. <coughs> Periodic agent, 25 seconds every 30 minutes. Pretty simple. You've got the ability to do anything in the background apart from use UI controls and access UI, the UI portion of your application from the background. So with that, we'll uh, do a, <coughs> a nice demo of something you couldn't do in, in uh, RTM and build a... Uh, Windows Phone music application. <coughs> so, simple file new project, and this is what you'll see in uh, Mango. The RC tools, you do have a go live license to use it with RTM and 7.1. So, you just pick which of the UI portion application version you want to target it for. So for you to get the ability to access the dormant state, you have to be a Mango application, so you have to be 7.1. But if you've got libraries that are 7.0, you can still use those 7.0 apps. The UI portion of your application needs to be targeted to 7.1. Right. <coughs> so by default, Here's my UI portion of my application. So to add a background agent, we add a new, pro new project, and you've got these three choices. A playback agent, a streaming agent, and a scheduled task agent. Scheduled tasks are for you to uh, add alerts and reminders to the user that will ensure them a nice, pretty dialogue. So today we're just going to have an audio playback agent. So audio playback agent is just a DLL, just a reference. It's installed right beside your application in the isolated storage. <coughs> so with the audio player, by default, you get the access to methods that you can next track, previous track, access to the audio player itself for you to do whatever you want to do. So here is our on-play on state changed event, which is raised where someone presses play, pause, next, and previous. You just switch the enumeration, and you can do whatever you want to do with the application. So let's add some music to our application. <coughs> Unfortunately, we need to use the So we've got new music in there. The background agent has only got access to the isolated storage part, the in, not the installation partition. So any resources or elements you need access to in your background agent 
you need to manually serialize them to isolated storage. So the, the easiest part for that is in your app class. We create a new method. <coughs> and here we're going to uh, do that. So for the interest of time, I'm going to copy something I prepared earlier. So what this is going to do is just going to copy those three music files for us straight into our isolated storage partition on our device so we can access them in our background agent. So we've, we've now serialized it. We need to add three buttons to our main page <coughs> to play, <coughs> sorry, to play, pause, and uh, next song. So simple stack panel. And we'll add three buttons. No UI designer, so uh, you're more than welcome to start laughing. Uh, we want. We then need to wire up our little buttons, so we need to name them first. Um, uh, next. <coughs> but not least. <coughs> cool. We've now got our, <coughs> our previous next and play buttons. <coughs> so all, all, all you really need to do here is <coughs> if we're not doing, all you need to do is call out to the music service that's running the, uh, running the device. which is a static instance, background audio player, play, pause, and uh, next. So most of the managed to native access in the phone, so background audio player, notification service, they're all static instances. And Jake will do, uh, talk a little bit about how you can test for that later on. Um, all right, so we want play. <coughs> we want a uh, background audio player. Uh, it's because it's a Mac. Yeah, true. It's because it's a Mac. That, that's all we need out of the, in the UI portion of your application. We've then got to go back in our background agent audio player, and we've got to load the songs. We've got to know the names of the songs, and then we've just got to wire up the, the play actions to do play next track, get previous track, and fast forward and rewind. So here we're just going to create a little list. track. And here we're going to have a new audio track, basic audio track. So here, it, at the moment, it's not smart enough to pick up the ID tags of the music you're playing. So you have to manually specify 
the album, album artist, the, not the duration, but the, the title, basically. <coughs> Yep, definitely. Something easy to put a wrapper class. Or when you're, when you're serializing your, your data, put it all in an XML file, read it, read it straight from isolated storage in the uh, audio player agent. Is there any questions while Chris is doing that? Chris answered that. I don't know. The so there is no limit. The theoretical limit for isolated storage is whatever's on the device. So if you've got the access to, if you've got two gig available on the device, you get to do with two, whatever you want with two gig. Yep. You don't have much option. There, there are limits. Yeah, there are limitations with it. It's just to basically save the device. Um, if you need more, hit like ping the team because they're interested to know uh, about scenarios that don't fit into the current model. But if if you do, you do fall out of that current model, then you've just got to. Um, there's not much you can do. One more. I don't think there's much, you don't have much options. Like, you've just got to be a good citizen with a lot of this stuff there. Uh, it's like with the memory limits and things, you've just got to, you know what the limitations of the device are and you've got to try and come up with a model that fits into that and we won't hit those limits. But. I might leave this one to the end just quickly and then <coughs> let Chris continue with his demo. Right. We'll come back. So now we've wired up our previous, previous and next tracks. All we've got to do is simply deploy to a device. Red hot tip if you're doing Windows Phone development, don't cheap out on the micro USB cable. It's, it's very, very finicky with Zoom and all the phones out there at the moment. Get yourself a good micro USB cable. You need a better one? This one's working, finally. <coughs> Deploying. So it does take a little bit to deploy if your apps you got 30 meg, 40 meg, 50 meg zap files. Um, unfortunately, that's just the way it is at the moment. And there is no sort of install time data, which is another shame. So that, that zap's probably 30 meg. It's going to take a good 10, 15 seconds to deploy. Just these things you need to test for. So does everyone know the limits for, for the zap files? So 20 meg, 20 meg is the user that can download over the 3G network. So these are, you need to look at that because not many people will have, have, have Wi-Fi access or the ability to go home Wi-Fi and download the application. So if it's 29 meg or it's just 30 meg, pull some stuff out and download it initially once the, users, the user has started. Come on, Zoom. 
come on Zach. So with the background audio agent, you do get access to the volume kickers. So with, with the phones off, the phone person then turns the phone on again. The volume kicker has the play, next, and previous buttons. You do get native access to that, so your application doesn't need to be running. Zoom service will call in to your background audio agent and say, hey, someone's pressed the play button, someone's pressed the back button, someone's pressed the next button. Give me the next previous, pause the current. That kind of stuff. So if you're streaming from the internet, you've still got access to all, the, uh, all that good functionality. And we're almost finished deploying. So now it's not audio. Right. So there's my app. We're now playing a song. So the UI portion of my application is now pushed into the background. It's dormant. You can't hear it, unfortunately, but the music is still playing. Someone presses the volume kicker. Oh, there's the music on, on cue. You've got access to the play, pause. And next button's up here, so if I hit next, it's going to change my track to what I just serialized. So that even though the UI portion of your application is in the background, we stopped all threads, it's dormant, your background audio, audio agent is still running. Phone's now off. Same thing. So in Mango, the users now will display the play, pause, and previous button on the lock screen. You've got access to that on the lock screen as well. So it's a seamless experience when you're writing your background audio agents. So that's the scenario for managed developers. But, but if I'm a web developer, what if I want access to the background audio? So we still thought of you here. All you've got to do is we'll add a new project. I'm just going to add a web project, empty project, <coughs> add our songs, <coughs> and now we've just got to add our default ASPX page. So for, for IE9 to pick up that your website is HTML5 and you're an ASP.NET developer, you need to change the doc type. By default, it's going to use XHTML transitional. So we just want to delete all this. There you go. You know HTML5 ready. If you haven't downloaded the HTML5 extensions for Visual Studio, go and get them via NuGet or go and get them via the extension gallery in Visual Studio, they give you IntelliSense straight into the audio tags for HTML. We then need to create a simple JavaScript library, oh, sorry, JavaScript method. function to, to change the track. Cool. Um, You've now got access to the audio player object in the DOM. 
So now we're just going to go media player. Next track. I don't want that. I want this. Yep, just change the source. And then we need to have the controls. That simple. And then we can deploy it. We then start our instance. The on end. Sorry? On ended methods. Next track. Good spotting. Rebuild. Cool. So this is what it's going to look like. And we'll get the phone to, uh, to navigate. Let's start the emulator. The Zoom doesn't, re the phone doesn't recognise the local host, as you would assume, so we need to put in our IP address. Okay, unfortunately, I'm going to give up on that one. It's not working. The only issue with the HTML5 uh, background audio, you don't get access to next and previous. So Zoom will only call into your JavaScript method when the song is finished playing. So it's up to you to go and fetch something then on your HTML5 web page. Notifications, they're in 7.0, it worked with a big caveat. If there was an issue with your application or the issue with the push notifications on the device itself, you had the user had to hard reset it for you to get the ability to go and do something, for you to get the ability to use it. So we realized that was an issue and it's fixed in Mango. We've also increased the number of applications you can use on a device with push notifications. It was 15, it's now 30. This is the default experience our end user sees for a push notification, and you as a developer have access to. The background of the tile on the home screen, the count, the title. The title also has to represent the name of the application before Marketplace will approve you. And a toast notification at the top here. So toast notification, you've got the little image and the text. So in Mango, you now get access to the back of the tile as well. So we'll flip the tile for you at random intervals. On the back, you can paint some content, full color images, whatever you want to do. And Jake's going to take you through a uh, nice push notifications demo now. Okay, so tiles have improved a heap 
in Mango, we didn't uh, before Mango rather, we didn't have many options. We had to basically, if we wanted to update the tile, do the cool live tile flippy things. Uh, you only got access to the front of the tile, as Chris said. You now got access to the back, and it was all via push notifications. You couldn't actually do anything. Uh, what I'll show you now is actually neat. Uh, how the experience has been improved in Mango. And just another side note, you can also update your tiles directly through your, your code now, which is one of the really, really cool things. So in here, we'll start off with an empty web application. My little tablet sometimes struggles. Uh, who's actually played and heard about NuGet here? So everyone's heard of NuGet. Good NuGet to see. is awesome. Um, it's a little slow right now with the network, but it's just a great way to get access to all these different packages and a whole heap of knowledge that every, there's a heap of people that spend so much time on open source work projects. So talking about open source projects, I'm going to download one called MetroPimp, and it helps you write push notifications really, really easily for Windows Phone. So let's go grab that. So that'll come down, install. You can also, uh, I'm not sure if you've, you're aware, you can see down the side, I've got a heap of different uh, sources. Where's this little pointery thingy? Oops. Cool. So I've actually got a heap of my own NuGet repositories, and that allows me to build NuGet packages locally, uh, like here. I just want to add a few images, so I can just put that in, and a whole lot of images have been added to my project. Really quite cool and simple. Um, I didn't need them in this project, but that's okay. First, how are you doing for time? So first off, I'll create a new form. Just call it default. So this is just for the test scenario. Here you do an Azure service or a background worker, basically. Um, a web service, your application then sends the URI to to register the, a specific phone so you can then send them push notifications. Do you want to walk through it while I code? Sure. So as we said, this is the uh, fake web service, just a little page. We're going to paste in the uh, URI. So when you when you register for a uh, push notification services on the device, you get a very specific URI. It's 200 and something characters long. Upload that to your web service at the end. When your application starts, register the device with the device ID. You then send them push notifications. Just with this, uh, what Metro Pimp actually gives you is a what's called it calls a pusher. So with that, you just go new, new up the pusher and create a, give it a URI, and we'll create a, uh, a tile. This just gives you a nice wrapper and easy way to configure the tile that you're actually going to push to the server. To, to save you manually crafting, hand crafting, the XML you need to send back to the phone. So it's uh, so it's a heap of time and effort. And we've also got toast notifications, as we were saying. Pretty awesome there. Mango is, once again, is all about the providing a richer experience. So one of the ways that Mango really <coughs> provides that rich experience is nearly every feature in Mango is deep linkable. So you can use deep links to add a heap of value to the uh, to your applications. So here we're specifying a XAML page inside our application. When we when you send that toast down, user hits it, navigates straight into that toast notification. Oh, sorry, that deep page. a new Windows Phone project. So 
So in here, what we want to do is wire up to the loaded event. And this is where we register uh, and create the channel. So I'll let Chris explain how all this works. So by default, you've got to give the channel a name. The, the OS then saves that channel to the registry and registers that with the device. So they give your channel a unique name that, that you might want to use. And then each time your application is loaded, you should be checking for the channel. If the channel's not there or it's been corrupt, the OS will delete it for you. And then you have to check every time the application starts. If it's not there, register a new one, re-upload that to your service. OK, so once, if we, when we go try and find the channel, it's not there, we have to register it. So we register it with the phone. There's two methods we're really interested in. Channel URI updated, and this is quite important for us testing locally because uh, when we can grab the, the end point that we have to send the notifications to. So what we'll do under here, so we'll just go debug dot right line. Under here. So channel URI updated uh, will fire every single time, no matter whether you got uh, you need to create a new instance of it or not. It'll give you the URI. So if, when you create a new instance of the HTTP notification class, always wire up to channel URI updated. That way you can re-upload it back to your service. And the other side is if we, so yeah, just re-wiring up. Okay. So this is where I'll use that little NuGet package to add those images to the wrong project. Wrong project. Didn't name it. <laughs> and I ran through that before. The other one was below. Again, okay, we've added that. Adds a whole lot of the background images and everything to our app. So as Jake mentioned, the, the deep linking with a little parameter for, for a notification you're going to send. So Toast notifications by default in 7.0 didn't support that. So when the user clicked on your Toast, it just never got it straight back to your application. That was up to you then to route them wherever you wanted to go. In 7.0, 7 7.1, we use the navigation service. So when you're sending a push notification, and which is a Toast message to the user, specify the actual URI you want the user to navigate to. Have a little query string at the end if you want to this is a direct message ID from the, from the Twitter for this user. Go and load this from the cache or load it from the web and just display it. No. So your application specific. So you can register for multiple channels. No, you don't have to worry about it. Good. So our debug.write line has written out this endpoint URL for us. So what we can do is jump into our, our web app, enter the URI there, and in our app, want to make sure that we get out of it. And then we can send a toast notification. And there you go, we've got a toast notification. Woo, demo. <laughs> and if you guys didn't see that, there's a really nifty thing in hmm? Good idea. There's a really nifty thing. If you want to get rid of a notification, you can just swipe it and it'll get rid of it. I find that quite useful and didn't realize it was actually a feature in the phone. Uh, the next one is tile notifications. So, yeah, pin it. Ah. One. Was it one or five? Uh, it's one. one. So the first thing we have to do is pin it, as Chris said. Once we pin it, we can actually then send a tile notification. And it'll push the new tile down to the phone, update it, and you've got little counters. So you get quite, MetroPimp really makes it simple to do. Now if we stop this, 
and I'll show you the double-sided stuff. So, so uh, education process for you as developers, you need to educate the end users to say, hey, I need you to pin my first tile, the, the main application tile to the home screen for you to visually see what's going on. So when they first load, say, hey, I've got some push notification features, or I've got some cool features to alert you, pin me to your home screen. But in Mango, you're allowed to pin secondary tiles. So in, in part of the application, you can say, I want you to pin this portion of the application to the front. That's going to then take the current page you're on, and we're going to use the navigation service to navigate the user. If they've clicked on that secondary tile, straight to that page in your application. It's another cool feature to if you've got something that's in your application that might be five or six pivots deep, get, give the user the ability to pin that portion to the home screen. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and you can also have query string parameters on that URI. Thanks, guys. <laughs> There's, you'll see it flip around. There we go. So we've got double-sided tiles now. And as I said, Metro Pet makes that really easy. And then dive straight in. You can see that's our normal home page. Send our toast notification. Click on the toast. We go through, and I didn't set it up properly. But anyway, <laughs> that's OK. Take my word for it. I'll continue on to the interest of time. So you put a, you put it a, it's up to you. So you as a developer, you'll put a little pin icon in the application bar and say, pin me to the home screen. So that when, you, when you fire off that, you create a new instance of shell tile task or shell tile and add it to the little collection you've got available to your application. That's going to redirect the user back to the home screen and show you where it's pinned. It's up to them to move it around. Not the main tile. But the secondary tiles, yes. So all you do is get a collection of secondary tiles that are pinned. That you can then delete them and do whatever you want with them. I'll show you uh, a bit later about the um, how to pin, how it works, how the deep linking works. If you're interested, should have a bit of time at the end for questions and showing off some stuff. So, okay. So next, this feet. Oops. Yeah. Thanks. So search extras. This is actually a feature that I have not seen really talked about anywhere. No one knows what it is, how it works, and the documentation is pretty awful on it. But I'm sure it's still pre-release documentation, so I'm sure that we'll get that. So what it allows you to do is wire in your application to value add on Bing search. So the user can hit the, the search button, bring up Bing, search for things, and say they find a location a bar or something, they can actually click on that. Bing gives you like the address, the phone number, all of those things that you can click on. And it'll, if you click on the address, it'll jump into Bing Maps so you can uh, look around. What Search Extras allows you to do is register your app with the search results. So you can uh, go across use in the panorama control, sw uh, switch across to the app tab, and then you can have your app registered there. So one of the examples is, um, I'll just jump in and give you guys a quick demo of how it actually works. So in here, hit Bing search. It takes a little while on the emulator to spin up. Hmm? Uh, I'm useless at that. And I don't remember what number everything's on. There's so many laptops up here. Okay. So we've got the emulator up here. We can go search for a local bar. Currently, I'm in America somewhere, so it doesn't really matter. It's the emulator. OK, so go in. We get these really cool things. We can jump into the address, get directions. Um, States actually has a heap more metadata on this, so our opening hours. Uh, good example of pinning. Here we go. We can deep pin that. and you've got a location pinned to your home screen, you can then jump straight back into it. So that's a really good example of deep linking. You can do that really, really easily in, in your app. Sorry for the slight deviation. But this is what the search extras is. You can register your app here, in the, and when you submit it to the marketplace, when it, it the, the Bing search thinks your app 
is relevant to that current location, you can put your app here. The user can then hit download app. That'll go jump straight into, uh, we can actually jump into here, but we can't download it. It'll jump straight into the uh, marketplace. You can buy, download it, whatever. It gives you that real nice integration. And it's a better experience than the app for that sort of model. So I'll show you how we can actually do that. Create a new Windows Phone project. And I'm not going to type all this out because it's a lot to type out. Huge amount of XML config, which they really, really like. So the first step in this is we actually want to jump into our app manifest. And this has a whole lot of useful information in there about capabilities that your app uses, the default navigation, that sort of thing. So just under tokens, you register uh, the extension names. So these are all location or places related extension names. So you can, you can actually hook into specific types of locations and just value add on those. Uh, the slide that I've navigated away from also has products, so product search, has movies and events as well. But like classic Microsoft, we only get locations in Australia. Um, but I can show you that. I'd imagine there'll be a regional update sometime in the future that will give us access to a lot more of those things. So what we do, we register these extension names and They've got this GUID that you have to provide. It's a standard GUID. It's in the documentation. And the consumer ID basically says that this extension is a search extras extension. Uh, there'll be a generic way to do it for all different type of extensions. And what we want to do is we specify the extras file. So in here, create a new folder, extensions. Then create a XML file called extras. What we have to put in our extras is copy it in so we get some niceties. So we start off, we've got the app title. You saw before in the emulator, we had the name of the app. That's what you see there. The download app. Uh, the download application text ends up being the caption. So before your app's downloaded, it says download app. After your app's downloaded, it'll actually show this caption underneath. These are all, all the extensions. And you can also register different captions for different types. So I could break that extension out as a different extension info, have a different caption. So you could give slightly different descriptions for different categories. Now this is really good segue into a feature that actually was in um, was in the original release, which is URI mappers, and that allows you to map a particular query or a particular URL or deep link. You can actually manipulate that and redirect it to a particular XAMR file. So what happens with the search extras? It is, is it actually just navigates to slash search extras question mark and then a whole lot of query string parameters. Issue with that is if you try and navigate to that, you'll actually just get a message box up or it, you'll get an exception thrown that says search extras isn't, I can't find any XAML for search extras. So you've got to use this URI mapper to map the two. What time do we finish? So we declare a resource. Uh, I've put it in the wrong spot, haven't I? No, it's right. Just get rid of that. Okay. So we declare it as a resource. We then go in to the constructor, and bottom of the constructor, we want to grab that resource out and set the URI mapper for the root frame to the one we've declared. And we want that to go to extras page.xaml. So I'll create that extras page now.
Whoops. On our extras page, I'll expose some of the data that we get passed. For places, there we go. Um, for places, we actually get a few different things. They pass us uh, the name of the place, the longitude and latitude, so we can map it if we want, or do whatever we want with it. They also give us the uh, address and the category that it lives in. And that's the category maps to the um, all these extension names. And if a place happens to fall into multiple cap uh, categories, it'll be comma separated. So we'll go jump into the code behind now. And I'll just create a couple of properties um, and wire into the loaded event. There are nice ways to do this, uh, nicer ways. I'll talk about that a little bit later. But um, yeah, so we hook into the, wide, the loaded event. We then get access to the query strings and we'll map all those different properties to the um, all the different query string parameters to the properties we've created. So that should be all we have to do. We'll just run that up now. Okay, there's our application. Really not anything to be proud of, but you know, we'll just do a bar again. We had a few of those last night, weren't we? It was actually really good unlike last year. Um, and there we go. So we've wired in our apps in there. We've got a little description under there. And if we click into that, we get our page and all the query and parameters. It's not extremely big. Um, let's bump that up a little bit. So yeah, we've got all the query string parameters, passes us the address, longitude, latitude, the category it falls into. So you can actually do a, I, I think this feature is actually quite cool. It has a fair amount of power and not many people know it's there and there's not much documentation. So I was really quite cool. I was really quite happy when I found and played around with this feature. Still a regular app. It's, a, it's about value adding and the improving the user experience. It's all about not just it's not an app for that model. It's about you using the phone and apps really just give you a better experience and there's a lot of extra hook points and it just makes the whole experience nicer with the tiles. A great example of tiles where the best app that I've seen use it so far is there's a TripIt app called My Trip, uh, My Trips, and the tile is your next flight. It's so useful. So as you see here, this is the, the, the typical region diagram that you get out of company based in the States that doesn't really care about anyone else. No, no kidding. Um, this is what's going to come at Mango RTM. So this is final, unfortunately. So you only get access to the, the place card that Jake showed you. Um, unfortunately, that's, that's, that's how it is. But if you're, if you're writing an app for multiple regions, you can still take advantage of the product card and movie card in your application. So even though you're developing in Australia, releasing it, you still get access to that with the phones in the US. So it's all about the region of the phone, not where you're submitting the app from. Excellent. So just top off, allows you to hook into search, and I showed you a little bit of the URI mapping stuff. Now we've got a demo side. I was talking to you, a uh, bit of a call to action, just uh, Go get an account for create.msdn. We've got a, there's free marketplace accounts to be had. So you can get a developer account, developer unlock your phone, start playing with this sort of stuff. 
And Chris was say, alluded to earlier that I've been working on a project that makes a lot of this stuff easier. So I've been working on a project called Windows Phone MVC. And if you've heard of ASP.NET MVC, I'm actually building an MVC framework for the phone as well. And adding a lot, like it supports search extras, deep linking, all of the new Mango features at the moment. So I've been spending a heap of time with that. So um, extending on the, the free marketplace account, here's a Microsoft tag and also a QR tag. Take a photo, scan it. Uh, we will send you uh, information and we will contact you. This is give your free marketplace account. We're looking for all the Windows Phone developers in Australia. So please register and we'll send you information about free events, training, all that kind of good stuff. And if you don't have $100 to spend for a marketplace account, take a picture and register. It's free, free for a year. So with that, Mango RTM'd over a month ago. Go back, so you want to take more pictures? All right, so with that, um, Mango is actually finished. It is in testing at the moment. Um, from what I can say is it's very, it's available very soon. So please, again, take pictures, register for the free marketplace, and um, evals, you win this uh, fantastic touch mouse. It is actually pretty cool. It's better than the uh, Arc touch mouse. <laughs> it works. Um, we'll just do some quick Q&A before we wrap up. So anyone got questions? Yes. Yep, so there's a, se a separate project for it's a background. Uh, it was, I'm trying to think of the name of the template. But yes, so you get access to, so the, the normal UI dialogue for calendars and, and reminders, you get access to do that. And when the, there's a deep link URI on that, so when the alert's fired off, the user clicks on that, that then redirects them to the specific URI for what you set for the uh, alarm or reminder. So back on the spotlight winner here down the front, for Mango, she'll, uh, what, she should, what she could do, the bus is leaving in five minutes, set a little alarm reminder for the person. If he wants to look at the details of the route, clicks on the button that's in the, in the alarm reminder, directs him straight to that page for the details of the route of the, of the, of the bus trip for him. So, pretty cool feature. Yeah, so that's the built-in player of the phone. So that's the Zoom API. So if I have two apps, both with background audio agents, which one gets the message? Whichever one calls it first. So if you've got, you've got two audio background applications, yeah. you only get to run one. So if your UI portion of your application kicks up and says, I want to start this background task, you're playing that. That says, says to the Zoom API, yep, there's a background audio t agent associated with this application go and look after it and go and play the uh, information. So the user has to launch the UI portion of your application to, to kick that off. If they then launch another UI portion of a different application that's using uh, the same functionality, yours will get stopped. So the question was about how you can add uh, shell tiles. There's actually just this, another static, they love their statics once again, uh, called shell tile. And you just go shell tile.create. So there is, you can create them. But what happens when you create a shell tile from code, you don't have to get the users to directly click something in your app. But as soon as you call shell tile.create, your app will exit and it will go and navigate down to that shell tile that you've just created. So you can only ever create one. You can't just fill up the user's home screen. So if you did do that and they didn't like you just adding it for no reason, you'll probably, the next thing they'll do is hold uninstall. So oh, Hold, review, one star, yeah. uh, uninstall. Yeah, the, so the, the question was about online versus offline updating of shell tiles. 
Um, basically, your background agents still have access to manipulate that shell tile, so you can update the counters and those sort of things from a background agent without going off to a web server, or you can to get like, how many mentions, if it's a Twitter app or whatever, but you can manipulate that via code in your background agents to do that. That's right? Yeah, that's correct. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, do you have a rough size? Uh, like three yeah, so three or four meg, you can do that in any agent. So you've got access to do that in any agent. If it's larger than 20 meg, use the built-in uh, background transfer service. So we briefly touched on that. Um, all you do is a static instance again. Give me this URL. Uh, give, me, sorry, give me this file. The background download service itself will download the file and put it in the isolated storage for you. And it'll also give you a progress bar. So if you wanted to show the user, yeah, this is downloading. Um, but it is a queue, so if there's other apps downloading stuff before yours, you're queued up. And if it's a large file, so if it's over 20 meg, they've got to be connected to Wi-Fi or, um, or the PC, and they've got to be on power. So the 20 meg limit is, uh, so it's, it's, it's across the platform really, so it's, it's for applications, it's for everything, so. It's just background transfer, st static instance, background transfer, give me this file, let me know when you're done. Yep, even if your agent stopped as well. So it, 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 the OS will then call back into your agent and UI and say, hey, download's finished. It's up to you to action on it. I'd assume, I'd, I'm actually not sure, in the demo, uh, my one did appear above the others, so I, I would assume that that would be the behavior, but I don't know for certain. So in, in, installed apps by default are grouped at the top, and downloaded ones available uh, underneath. It'll only sh uh, so w the question was about who it shows with. I know there's a private marketplace, and it's also sort of opt-in. So I'm not sure exactly how all the private marketplace works. So there, there's, a, there's a tag on every single application submitted to the marketplace. If you're private, you're private. You're not invisible in search. You can't get access to anything. So you really, it's it's all or nothing, unfortunately. Yeah, but private marketplace. Um, it's private, but you're there for 120 days. You can't update the app. So just keep submitting new ones if you want to do that for beta testing and stuff.